I'm so glad you decided to join us this afternoon, coming live from the American Rose Center. Uh, beautiful, getting ready for the garden uh, for the convention in May, which we hope you will come see us May 5th through the 7th. Uh, if you haven't uh, signed up for the convention, please visit rose.org where you can do so. Today, we will be talking about judging photography from good to better to best, presented by our national uh, chair, Ms. Pam Powers. Pam is an accredited ARS horticulture judge, active consulting rosarian and exhibitor, and the president of the Arlington Rose Foundation. Under her leadership, the membership of the foundation has grown from 110 to 250 members. Her focus is on community outreach and interactive skills-based training with rose lovers in the greater Washington, D.C. area. As an early adapter of rose photography, Pam partnered with experts to successfully teach and grow interest in digital and print photography competitions in her own organization. She has appointed as the ARS Photography Chairperson in September 2021. Pam grows a diversity of over 130 roses at her home in Fairfax, Virginia, and serves as curator for unique rose gardens at private estates. Pam? Thank you so much, Sean. I appreciate it. I can't wait to get started today for judging rose photography. I thank you all for signing on. We have about two hours together. The presentation will run about an hour and 15 minutes, and then we have time for Q&A. Uh, our agenda that was included in your registration is about consistency and confidence in judging rose photography. Uh, our agenda will flow like this. It's how to write a solid schedule at your local level. Um, a little bit about how, how the eye works. Some guidelines for judging uh, photos in different horticultural classes. Some point scoring. Uh, guidelines for judging photos of uh, gardens, uh, creative interpretations, and macros. And then a little process to engage and encourage exhibitors. Uh, and then we'll move to our Q&A. So horticulture credits uh, earned for this training is reading or rereading, or rereading and reading again, the rules guidelines for judging rose photography is one credit. Uh, attending, listening to the training uh, seminar is one credit. And then there's a, a follow-up assignment to earn another credit and to help uh, build confidence and consistency in judging. When you registered, um, you answered the question in the uh, qu three questions in the last five years, have you earned at a local level? a top award, meaning best in class, best in show, or gold, silver, bronze certificate in photography. Now, on this call, there were, well, registered, there were 130 registrants, and 30% uh, of them said yes. In the last five years, they had earned, um, at a local level, a top award. And then to the question in the last five years, have you earned a district level, a top award, meaning best in class or best in show or gold, silver, bronze certificates in photography? 23% said yes. And then to the question in the last five years, have you earned at national level a placement of first, second, third, or honorable mention? 19% uh, said yes. So uh, the, what's behind this is the um, we want to engage. If you uh, are exhibiting in photography, uh, then that aids your judging abilities. And that engagement is very, very important. So it was to see where we stand. And I hope when we do a similar survey in a year, that the, those percentages will be greatly increased. So first up is writing a solid schedule at the local level. Uh, I've had the good fortune of, re of reviewing uh, many, many uh, schedules from the local societies. And there's some must-haves in writing a solid schedule. Uh, and certainly it includes a time frame for entries, 
the number of photographs allowed per exhibitor, and no duplicate photos in multiple classes. So some, some groups uh, will say 10 total, uh, others will say three per exhibitor. Whatever you decide as a local group is, is fine. Uh, the size, I think it's much better to offer one size. And five by seven for local contests is uh, recommended. There's always a question of should they be uh, matted, mounted. Uh, it adds another hurdle to get people to put their uh, photos in. Most of the local groups do not use matted or mounting, um, and they just have the photos uh, displayed flat. Uh, but again, that's up to your local group. If you've been doing it that way, where you do require mounting, that's fine. Others see it as a little bit of a barrier to, to entry. Then who's eligible to enter? Um, it's amateur. I was recently asked, so if someone makes their living doing photography, uh, can they enter a local contest? Well, how you write the schedule is very important. It, uh, most of them are for amateur photography, amateur uh, photographers. So write your schedule with that intent. Uh, youth, how do you define youth? Is that uh, age six and up? Uh, 12 and up? Uh, is it open for your members only? These are internal discussions that, you know, that you want to have. The goal is to encourage and to be as open as possible. Uh, upward progression of entries is encouraged. Downward or lateral progression is not. What, what does that mean? So if you went at a local level, uh, you certainly want to move that uh, particular uh, photo upwards to the district level or to the national level. But if you win at um, a national competition, then it is ineligible to move. You don't want to reshow it at a local level. So that downward or lateral progression is not allowed. Uh, you want to make a statement about digital enhancements, uh, a statement about exhibitor grown. Uh, uh, many, many of the um, societies offer uh, just like they do with arrangements. If something is exhibitor grown, uh, you uh, qualify for a bronze, silver, or, or gold cert ARS certificate. Uh, row, so it's extra bragging rights. Uh, you need to write in your schedule, roses must be identified, uh, when and how to claim photos, how will awards be bestowed, is it best in class, and then those best in class compete for a first, second, and third place. You know, how is judging conducted? Um, and that point scoring must be stated as exactly in the uh, photography rules and guidelines. Now, our photography rules and guidelines, uh, I, I just think it's an excellent handbook. The only little quibble I will have with it is that uh, for a, a photography rules and guidelines, it lacks photos that illustrate the point that is being made. So, uh, you know, looking forward to no material change in rules and guidelines, but better illustration of those. Um, classes, uh, descriptions, they need to be simply stated and clearly outlined, you know, how judged. You don't want to put a, a, cat a class up that you have no idea how to judge. And then what are the photography awards that the exhibitors are buying for? So that thought goes into writing a solid schedule. So if you're a, a, a photo chair or a judge or someone who's been appointed you know, to write uh, a schedule, uh, these are good considerations to think about. 
it will avoid uh, problems uh, down, down the line. And then there are a few logistics to think through on a local level is how to buy, provide help during entry time, you know, so that exhibitors uh, are well supported. And how will the photos be displayed? Will they be flat on tables or do you have ladders of some sort to um, display them vertically? And if anyone needs good examples of ladders at the local level, I'm happy to uh, provide you with a couple of sources who I think have done a great, great job with their ladders. Uh, who, what will designate judging placement? Will it be dots or ribbons? And how will the winning photos be displayed? A separate table upright uh, in a metal or wooden holder? We want to think through that because we want to um, merchandise or market or recognize uh, those winning photos. And then ordering ARS certificates in advance for those uh, exhibitor, uh, exhibitor grown awards is important. So when we talk about, you know, growing uh, photography exhibit, uh, exhibiting at your local society, to me, the judges are in the catbird seat. They are the ones who can lead by example and grow exhibiting from it, from a horticulture perspective, an arrangements perspective, or a photographic perspective. You may want to consider rebranding your show, Rose and Photography Show. Uh, give thought uh, to how you display those photography exhibits. Um, host photo shoots spring and fall, and use use your expert in your district you know, to do that. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it really engages people. And uh, holding those photo shoots give them an opportunity that they otherwise would not have. Yeah. Get some great prizes for your winning photos. I know at in in my local group we have a. a uh, an upscale garden center that uh, has like donates gift certificates of a large amount and uh, people really buy for those. Uh, you may want to consider collect, select winning photos from your local group for your program cover or for in, inside your program. You could mention that this was the top um, uh, photo, uh, you, you can put one on the cover and another one inside your program. Uh, posting the local winners on your society's social media sites and encouraging participants to enter in district and national competitions is, uh, is the key. Uh, you know, don't let them uh, go make the effort and and feel unrecognized. You want to be sure that they're fully supported and well recognized. That goes for all of us. <laughs> okay, uh, so many people talk about, you know, what what do judges want? And um, I, I mean, aside from things like, you know, disqualifications and, I mean, the true judging comes for uh, valuing that photo. And those rules are long standing, and it has to do with how the eye works, not necessarily what judges are looking for. Uh, judges are looking for exactly how the eye works. So in other words, a sharp focus for the eye to settle on, you know, something that's well cropped because cropping gives the subject room to you know move into or look into the picture sometimes you can crop too close i'm a tiny bit guilty of that sometimes i have to rethink some of my my cropping because i tend to um, crop closer rather than far away but cropping is a 
something to to pay attention uh, to. So there's really no mistake into what's intended. And if you're talking landscapes, uh, how the eye works is that it's not interested in uninteresting sky or any bland, you know, foreground. Uh, it's interested in movement, in motion, in being taken along a, a journey around a path or to the end of a tunnel. Uh, tunnel. Uh, sometimes people stage uh, photographs. I know uh, John Matia, for example, uh, he does a lot of this in the uh, Elizabeth Park uh, garden, and they have a uh, you know, uh, beautiful kind of tunnel of uh, roses. And he set up a beautiful shot by planting two people at the very end of it, kind of as an anchor so that your it pulls your eye to the end of that tunnel. Um, and it's quite, quite lovely photo. Uh, you don't want to truncate the subject, uh, and that kind of rule may be out when we're talking creative interpretive uh, photos, but um, it's because it's jarring and it leaves an incomplete look. And one of the big, big things about how the eye works is distractions, and we talk about this all the time in horticulture. And so in your photography, you don't want to include objects that don't add to, or more importantly, distract from the main subject of interest. And this gets at what does that background look like? You may have a beautiful, beautiful, um, per perfect horticultural specimen. And the background is so distracting your eye wanders to the pot or to the mulch or to uh, a patch of black spot or whatever it is that's distracting and it takes your focus off that incredible bloom. So again, it's how the eye works. And your eye responds to uh, depth of feel and that's simly the distance from the front to the back that's in focus. And I always say, wow, this pops. Uh, if something has a good depth of feel. This depth of field is a little hard to uh, achieve uh, with the smartphones. Uh, perhaps with the professional models, it's getting better, the three lenses. But with your professional cameras, um, uh, this uh, depth of field is, is very important. And I have uh, a good example to show you. So, um, from the judging rose photography guidelines and rules, uh, point scoring is set just like point scoring is set for horticulture and it's set for arrangements. And um, this, it, when you're writing your schedule, this point scoring is your way of communicating to your exhibitors uh, and judges, you know, how, um, the, how your rose photographs will be judged. And there's 5% for conformance. And you'll see in the uh, manual, it breaks down conformance, you know, to a T. Like if you're taking just one bloom, you know, is it named? Is the, uh, is the uh, name of the rose shown? Is the name of the exhibitor not shown? Um, is the arranger named? In other words, does it conform to, uh, to, to entry rules? And then horticultural excellence uh, is, is the reason you're here because the majority of the classes uh, that we have are around horticultural excellence. When we talk one bloom or spray or open bloom um, or singles uh, or 
miniatures, any of the Hort classes, 50% uh, of the of your, and this is internal point scoring, is, um, it is about horticultural excellence. You're just applying that to a photo. 15% composition, technique, and distinction. When we talk about uh, composition, we're talking about uh, color, quality, contrast, uh, framing of a subject, uh, simplicity with the lack of distraction. If you're talking about technique, which is 15 points, that includes like correct exposure, depth of feel, uh, lighting. And, and does the photo, does it feel that the photo pops, meaning you could uh, reach out and touch it because when that's achieved, um, you, you've got a great photo. And then distinction. Uh, distinction has to do with um, is there a wow factor? Or as uh, Bill Kay will, will tell you uh, when he goes through the creative interpretive photos that this distinction means, you know, would you want to take a take that photo and hang it on your wall and look at it every day and never get tired of it? So uh, 15 points distinction, uh, that's a lot. And so the total is 100. We don't do point scoring every photo. I mean, if you have 1,200 photos, that would be a bit unrealistic. But when we get down to, um, you know, the three or four that you're looking at, point scoring is, is very important. And you do want to keep this in the back of your mind, just like you do in horticulture uh, judging. You want to have this template and it needs to be firmly fixed. And if you don't, there's nothing wrong with having the manual with you. Uh, you take it, take it, print it out, or have it online. And as you uh, address uh, the very photos that are very close to call, uh, use this point scoring technique. It will help a lot. So, if we could point score class two together. I hope everyone recognizes uh, this this little miniature. Uh, Crazy this, Dottie. Yeah, that's it. Crazy Dottie. So uh, it's a very photogenic rose. I mean, we we see a lot of Crazy Dotties and some a lot of singles uh, because uh, many of them are photogenic because of the simple construct and the um, the beautiful stamen that it offers up. So two side-by-side -side pictures, and this is the same rose taken a day apart with two different cameras. So on the left-hand side of your screen, if we go through uh, and point score this, you know, how do you think it's fresh? Which bloom looks fresher? Which bloom, uh, the conformance is the same, the horticultural excellence, so 50%, which bloom looks fresher? Which bloom has better coloration of the petals? Okay. Which bloom has uh, uh, not only the petals, but fresher stamens. And then if you look at, uh, you know, composition, wow, which bloom pops? Which bloom has no distraction? Okay. And as far as technique goes, um, I think the 
the lighting on one is better uh, than the other, although I wouldn't quibble. I think the, uh, certainly the foliage on one in the framing, the cropping is better on one than the other. I'm a little distracted by the dirt in the upper left-hand corner of the rows on the right. I'm a lot distracted by the cropping of that. And from a distinction standpoint, um, although there are a few color faults in a, a a few uh, blemishes in the petals, and I probably uh, uh, would advise to uh, uh, Photoshop the little white color marks on the petals. It would make it a perfect photo. But if you point score these, because of the depth of field, because of the framing, because of the lack of distraction, the one on the left point scores much higher than the one on the right. Uh, I would take off several points for the, uh, the freshness. You can see the, the curve on the uh, petals on the left, they're just opening. The one on the right, it's gone from yellow to white and those petals are flat. So to me, that's the difference of a couple of points. The distraction, the, the cropping, I would take off a couple of points from the one on the right. So um, to me, easy choice is the one on the left uh, would receive the, the highest points for me. It would be my pick. Okay, so uh, judging one bloom, again, you're going to follow simply horticultural guidelines, 50%. You're gonna ask yourself, is it fresh? Is there good uh, coloration representative of the variety? Is there good symmetry? Is there a distinctive center? No distractions. Uh, and then from a photography standpoint, which is 45%, is the subject completely in focus? There are many times where, um, where maybe the front part of the, the rose will be in focus and the side or the back will be out of focus. Uh, is it overexposed or underexposed? Uh, and there's a, a way to, um, to address that, just some uh, techniques to either diffuse lighting or to reflect lighting. Uh, does it pop, meaning there's a good depth of, uh, of field? Is it well cropped? Is there movement? Is there a well factor? Are there no distractions? So these are the things you, you ask yourself and you discuss because uh, in photography, we team judge and we mimic uh, the same process we have in horticulture. It's team judged, and then the top uh, rows is to select the court. It's done through um, balloting of, uh, of the judges. So let's look at uh, this one bloom. This is black Bacara. Uh, uh, I love this photo, but it can be improved. When you first look at it, what stands out to me are the leaves. And that's because of the way the photo was cropped. And then if I take a closer look at this, you know, I really like the symmetry of the bloom. I love the separation of petals. I love the lighting on this. Um, the cropping can improve, but the center is almost gone. 
this photo is just maybe a day late or maybe a, a morning late. So if you're judging one bloom and you have this, this is, uh, of course, Moonstone. Um, and you can see how lovely it is nestled in the green foliage. Uh, there are what we call, you know, floating blooms. They have that black background. Uh, we, you kind of want to be aware of that. It can be distracting to some, just a stark black background. You know, seeing the rows framed by foliage in more of a natural setting uh, typically should be rewarded. You know, if we look at this and you, you it, it's, it's in motion to me because the symmetry is so nice that it looks like a spinning wheel. And that symmetry is what draws you into this. Also the coloration and this wonderful separation of petals. Um, and this, this photo is by uh, Mattia, if I remember correctly. But in the same category of one bloom, and, and this has a wow factor. Uh, Moonstone is, when we were keeping records of exhibition roses and exhibition winners, you know, Moonstone has been in the top 10 category across the country uh, for an exhibition rose. And it's been number one or two for the last 10 years. So naturally, it's a very photogenic rose. Again, this is Moonstone, a different version and quite excellent. This was submitted by um, Glenn Hodges uh, in Kansas City. And you can see how this Moonstone is also nestled in very lush green foliage. The petal separation is wonderful. The coloration is compared to the other moonstone is a bit different. It's a little more washed out. The, the other had a lot of more pink coloration. So let's look at the three of these combined. And if you were judging these three, the Black Bacara, the Moonstone, and the Moonstone. You know, which would you choose? And if you think about, you know, the wow factor, the distinction, uh, the coloration, symmetry, separation of petals, everything from a horticulture perspective overlaid with your um, photography perspective, you would go with the uh, center moonstone. So if we're looking at open bloom, stamen showing, you want to ask your rose, yourself, <laughs> is the rose fresh? Are those stamens fresh? The operative word in this is stamens, okay? open bloom, stamen showing. Is the coloration representative of the variety? Good symmetry, distinctive symmetry, uh, no distractions. And from a photography standpoint, is the subject completely in focus? Is it overexposed, underexposed? Does it pop? Is it well cropped? Is there perhaps some movement? Are those stamens swaying in the wind? Are they luring you in? Is there a wow factor? Are there no distractions? Do the stamens pop? You know, this is a fun, fun category. Um, and once you start entering this, boy, you will pick up 
on which uh, on different roses that are perfect for this category. Like sugar, sh this isn't sugar moon, this is Marc Chagall, but um, sugar moon is a white rose with beautiful golden stamens that have red anthers. So uh, it's always a, a showstopper if you can get a you know good shot of it. But let's just look at this um, this photo. And you look at the petals. Striped roses uh, are fun to judge. If you look at this really, really closely, this is a wonderful bloom. I love the cropping, love everything about it. If you look to the left, there are a few petals that are somewhat um, maybe weather beaten, but the stamens are as fresh as they can be. And I don't know if it's the angle, perhaps it is, or, or, the, or the rose itself. The, the, um, the center is a slightly offset. It's not exactly symmetrical. It doesn't bother me that much. A few of the petals do, though. And on these striped roses, you have to look really, really close for kind of a little bit raggedy petals, maybe a little weather tainted. But stamens showing, bam. And if you look at uh, this particular rose, I believe this is opening night. So, uh, this is a very showy rose, these golden, golden stamens on a, a red rose. Um, th there are some improvements that could be made to this photo. If you um, look at the, from a horticulture perspective, there's some petal faults in there. Uh, this, the, um, there's a lot of uh, spray material on the foliage. From a photographic perspective, the I, I would have cropped out. Uh, it, I would have cropped it much differently to crop out the the bud that's distracting uh, from above, and making flat the um, petals that are impeding full viewing of the stamens would have helped. It's also a tiny bit overexposed. Uh, if you see, we're losing definition of the main bloom uh, to the left-hand side of the bloom. Seems like the focus is on the lower right hand. And so what gets, it gets washed out. Um, so from, has, uh, again, some, uh, some points would be taken off for each of those items mentioned. Not a, not a pleasing uh, framing, particularly for this. So this uh, open bloom stain and showing, um, lovely, lovely foliage uh, and good symmetry good separation of petals, and nothing uh, hiding the, uh, the stamen and anthers. So when you put them together and you're judging, um, the nod would go to the, um, the rose on the left. And the name escapes me right now, but uh, excellent uh, submittal. Okay, so if we're talking about judging sprays, and this is a again a very popular class, it, it can be a little bit hard, particularly if you go to you know public gardens for this. Um, this is uh, love at first sight. No, it, it, no, what is it? Concentrating. Falling in love, perhaps. Pardon? Falling in love, maybe. Yes. 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 Falling in love. 
Thank you. Thank you. I knew it was love. Fallen in love. Uh, the the blooms are magnificent. Uh, if you if you want some good thorns, uh, this is the rose for you. It's very very thorny, but with these delicate uh, pink blooms on it. So with the spray class, uh, what counts? And from a horticulture perspective, is inflorescence, and that's creating a pleasing shape when viewed from above or from the side. And that pleasing shape can be a triangle, it can be an oval or a circle. If there was a fourth bloom that took off in another direction that distracted from this, this would fall apart because this is about inflorescence. That's true in hort, and it's true in photography. You want to capture that lovely inflorescence. They got this at um, equal stage of bloom, their exhibition form. So this is a lovely photo. There's a little greenery down at the bottom. Otherwise, you know, the background is, is black. This is, um, help me out. I I'm State of Grace. This is State of Grace, nestled in nice, uh, lush green foliage. I think the cropping is superb on this. Uh, again, the inflorescence. This is more of a decorative form rose as it begins to open up. They captured that pretty much at equal stages, but this coloration that it shows, the pink uh, in, in fading into caramel colors, I think the coloration on this is exceptional. So this is more of a triangle shape. And so here's another uh, spray. So this is, um, it's nestled in nice foliage. Uh, it definitely has a nice triangle shape, good inflorescence. But if we put on our, uh, our hoard cap, we can see that the top right-hand side bloom, um, it has a, a petaloid, if you will, over top of the stamens. And if those stamens are fresh, uh, you know, maybe they should show. And then the bottom one, um, it's not good separation of petals. Perhaps uh, if the stamens were fresh, a petal could be removed to show that. And then in this, uh, it's actually four, four blooms there. The fourth bloom is, um, a bit neither here nor there. Um, it's, um, it's, it's lost its luster. And then uh, there's a little distraction about how this is cropped. If you look to the um, right-hand side and also from top to bottom, uh, the top doesn't have any space to it and the, the bottom has probably an inch and a half. So just some, uh, some, a little grooming and some better cropping uh, would, would make it uh, a, a better uh, contender. So if you're judging these three, uh, the nod would go to um, State of Grace. So for, with that, what I'd like to do is uh, next talk in the interpretive uh, creative classes and um, I'll leave that to Bill Kuzinchak who is on the call. Uh, Bill Kuzinchak and uh, Rich Fair are co-presenters today. Uh, Bill is uh, a master, masterful exhibitor, uh, CR, photographer, uh, and leader in his organization. He grows uh, 
over a thousand roses. He holds photo shoots to help others. He is the photography chair of Penn Jersey uh, and has a lot of experience and success uh, in the creative interpretation. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Bill. Thank you, Pam. Okay. Um... When we're doing the uh, creative interpretation class um, in the judging guidelines, the first sentence has on page 44, a photograph should demonstrate originality and creativity. Um, and the first line here is, is it imaginative? And what you're looking for is something other than just an actual photo of a good horticultural exhibit. Um, it's another way of looking at the rose or uh, parts of the rose. Um, second, second line we have is it is use of good photing edit. The use is the use photo editing software ranging from filters composited edits artfully done. Um, there's a lot of photo filters anymore in the the. Uh, Photoshops and other programs you can use to edit photos. And a lot of times, you know, they're really easy to use, but you don't always get the result you want. Um, a lot of times it's playing with it. I've done, I've used a lot of different photos and photos I've entered. And a lot of times you, you know, you get something pretty quick. Other times you gotta spend some time on it to get, to get what you're looking for. Um, Someone just goes on, clicks a button, you know, whatever the preset is for it and enters it. It's not not going to be really artfully done. It's just going to be a different way of looking at it. Um, so it is something you, you need to take some time doing if you're, if you're, you know, using filters to kind of make the photo. Uh, second, next is, uh, is there still photographic excellence with no or cultural editing, but background changes that make it unique? Um, sometimes you, people will take a rose and the rose can be as you would see it, but it can be put in a different setting. Um, the background could be changed to make it look like the rose is somewhere else or part of a scene from somewhere else, um, not necessarily in the garden. Um, another thing I want to say is um, in the uh, guidelines, Uh, you don't necessarily have to use um, Photoshop. Um, one of the lines on page 25 when they talk about creative interpretation is the judge needs to remember that actual photographic excellence can also be used in creative interpretation with no use of photo editing software. Um, You'll see when I get to my examples, I have a photo like that um, that was taken in the garden. And when I saw it, it reminded me of something. So I named it that. Um, and there was no filters used with it. But in my mind, it was a really excellent, you know, creative interpretation. Um, so that's another thing. You don't necessarily have to use Photoshop for editing software for it. And I've, uh, I've been in some photo show or some road shows where they've been judging photos and they get to the class and some of the times you'll hear a judge say, well, I don't know if this is really abstract because there's no photoshopped onto it. It doesn't necessarily need to be photoshopped. If you can convey the feeling of something else with the, the object you're taking, um, it doesn't necessarily so keep that in mind um, when you're judging that you don't have to have one, two, three, four different filters used in the thing. Um, it's really good photographic excellence and it, the picture conveys something other than what you're looking at. Um, that's also a really good way to, you know, enter the creative interpretation classes. Um, Next line is the photo busy or so cluttered that it becomes distracting. You can uh, 
we've seen a lot of examples of photos that are just over photoshopped. Um, sometimes people think the more they do or the more colors or um, more different filters they can use makes it a really great photo, but sometimes it's just, there's too much going on and uh, it becomes distracting and it's not something you uh, are really impressed with. Um, they're not really conveying a feeling of something. It just looks like they spent a lot of time manipulating the photo. Um, creative naming is also part of the creative interpretation. Um, is the work creatively named? Um, that's another thing when I, you enter stuff, I, I try to come up with something creative of what the photo is conveying to me or what it should be conveying to the people that are looking at it. Um, I have entered some where I really haven't creatively named it and they've still done well, but that is something that the judges are looking at and it will certainly help kind of maybe sway them in the direction you're looking um, when you created the photo. You know, if they, they read the name and then they see the photo and it, it clicks, okay, this is what the person's doing. Um, that's a, you know, a big part of it. So you wanna try to be creative when you name it. Okay, this is the, uh, these are some of the photos I've entered in the past. Um, this one is uh, Rosa Rubifolia. Uh, Rosa Glocka. This was done with a uh, neon edges filter. Um, what it was originally, I I've, I've entered this different photos this a couple times. It was I took I cut sprays off the Rosa Glocka, Rosa Rubifolia, and I laid it on a black velvet background um, to kind of take away any distractions. And then this one here, I uh, I used the neon edges and kind of manipulated it until I got the kind of look I wanted. Um, the color was pleasing to me. Um, it kind of makes it a little bit different than what you would just see the rose, you know, at, at the hips is, you know, in plain color. Um, and in my idea, this is this was a good, you know, good entry. Um, I liked it, it was very pleasing to me. Um, It's not the best that I've had. Next, Pam. All right, um, this one here, as I said before, um, you don't necessarily have to use a lot of filters or any filters. Um, this is Sweet Vivian. Um, this is a shot of stamens I took. Um, I've entered it in color, and this one is in black and white. Um, the abstract class, I think the black and white popped a little more, made it a little bit different than just having it in color and seeing, you know, just like a kind of like a horticultural exhibit. And I also took it from the back. Um, we're shooting stamen photos, we're usually doing it from the front or from an angle from the front. Um, and I just happened to be walking by one day and I saw this and I thought, I really like the look of it from the back, and it's you know kind of a different interpretation. Um, another exhibitor had entered one last year in the ARS contest in a place that I forget what class it was in, um, but it was a similar angle, and you can really see the detail on the uh, the sepals here. Um, the stamens are nice and crisp, really good photographic excellence, and this one I don't really I didn't really give. A good name to it. Um, I think I just called it uh, posterized sweet Vivian stamens. So it kind of lost a little there. But um, as Pam had mentioned earlier, one of the things I like in the judging guidelines as far as distinction um, was in there is is this a photo that I won't get tired of? Is this a photo I would enjoy hanging on my wall and not get tired of it? And this is one every time it pops up, I, I always enjoy seeing it. And it's one that I would really like to have hanging, you know, maybe someday I'll get a print of it made. So this, I like it a little bit better than, you know, the past one. Next. 
Uh, this was a first place winner either last year or the year before um, in a master class, the abstract class. Uh, this is easy on the eyes. Um, I think I did watercolor filter on this. Um, it was an excellent uh, horticultural bloom. Um, good photograph, um, as Pam mentioned before, but the cropping. Um, it's framed nice by the, uh, the leaves. But you get a little bit different feel um, with the watercolor filter. And it's something I play with quite a bit to try to get it to look exactly like I wanted to. Um, wasn't just a matter of one click and boom, I'm done. Um, it kind of looks like I may have taken, you know, the photo somewhere and had someone paint it or someone come to the garden almost and, and kind of paint it. So um, this is one I really like. And this is another one that I don't think I'd ever get tired of if I had it hanging on my wall. Next. So you can kind of see the three of them here. Um, I do like all of them. Like I said, the uh, the Rubifolia hips, it's interesting, um, catches your eye. There's a lot of movement in it. Um, with all, <laughs> all the colors and the neon and, you know, the crazy stamens on those, it's, it's one that does make your eye move around a lot. Um, and the Sweet Vivian, the stamens, like I said, I just, I really love the position of the, the, the rose and the angle that it was photographed from. And um, there's a feeling of motion there. It looks almost like the stamens are being blown, you know, by yeah. the wind away from you. Exactly. So, um, and like I said, the, the detail um, in the stamens and stuff are the sepals. You know, you can see the, the small hairs and stuff. Um, I think it makes it a little better than the Rubifolia one. And then the, uh, the last one, like I said, I just, it, it kind of reminds me of a painting somebody would have did of that. Um, to me, <laughs> there's not a huge difference between the three of them, um, especially between the, the stamens, the sweet baby and, and the other. Um, and you're gonna have that when you're judging, um, you may get two, three, four, five photos that are just so close. Um, you're kind of nitpicking here or there, or just, you know, as seeing whichever one really, really moves you and which one, like I said, the, the, when you get to this level of competition, um, a lot of the photos are going to be really close. So a lot of it does come down to the distinction one. Have you seen this before? Um, is it something new? Is it something that people do all the time? Um, those photos is something that people do all the time. They kind of don't tend to do as well. If it's something new or a little bit different way of looking at it, or even a different row sometimes on the same way that's unique that you haven't seen, that can make a pop. And and when it comes down to you know picking the best of, um, I think keeping that thought in your mind. If I had to look at these photos every day, you know which one am I gonna you know. <laughs> enjoy for the longest and not ever get tired of looking at it. So um, that's kind of how I, I try to determine when I get to, you know, we get to the top of the, the classes and we're picking the best. So I kind of try to keep that in my mind. Next. Uh, this is another um, photo here. Now this one, I walked out in the garden. It was in the middle of the winter. I was taking snow pictures. And this was behind my house, I think under the gutter. Um, water had been falling down where the snow had melted and it dripped on this rose rose leaf. And as soon as I looked at it, I thought it looked like a butterfly chrysalis to me. Um, so, I, of course, I had my camera. I was probably out taking snow pictures that day. So I snapped photos of it. I thought it was really interesting. And when I come in and I put it on the computer, I just I fell in love with it. Um, to me, it's got that feeling of the snow chrysalis plus the uh, the water on it that had frozen. Um, the leaves are all dried up brown rose leaves that are 
are going to be gone, you know, surely. But with the ice and the sunlight hitting it, um, very nice. They look almost gold. Um, it's got that really nice photographic quality to it. And like I said, I, I did nothing to this photo as far as filters or anything. Um, this is the way it looked in the garden with the sun shining on it. So, um, and I've entered this quite a few times. Most times it didn't do much until I finally ended up winning um, one of the contests, but um, at the district level. But um, for years and years, I just thought, you know, this is another one I wouldn't mind having. But in saying that, it, uh, the background's not real exciting. So it's, although I love the thing, um, it's a good, good photo. Um, I really love it, but it could be a little better. Um, this one here is sunstruck. Um, I think this was posterized too. Um, it's one of the filters on the thing. It was a beautiful bloom, great horticultural, you know, excellence to it. Beautiful center, nice symmetry. It just, um, the way the petals unfurl, um, I thought I wanted to do something with it. So I didn't think it was going to win in horticultural classes. Um, had a few issues, but I just love the color of the bloom. And I thought I need to do something with this. So I, I played around with a lot of different filters until I came upon this one. And then probably spent another 20 minutes, half hour getting it to exactly where I wanted it with the shading. Um, it just enhanced the beauty of the rose already. Um, posterizing a lot of the shadows were a lot lighter. And when I used the posterized filter, it you could see down inside the petals um, where you'd have the dark apricot color um, turned to black and it just kind of exaggerated the uh, the shape of the rose and the petal and the depth of it, it just um, really made it pop. So um, I kind of like this one, you know, better than the other one. Next. And this was the, uh, once again, the, the Ruberfolia um, hips. Uh, this was the original shot that I had used you know but this i believe was posterized also um and it looks very close to how they look naturally but the posterizing just gave it a, a different texture and a different feel and uh when you look at it as pam said you know eye movement um <laughs> I look at it and my eye wants to go in a hundred different directions. Um, the curve of the sepals, um, the different colors, you know, the voids, you see the hips, um, the black background kind of keeps you um, focused yes. on the hips. Yes. But yes. my, my <laughs> every time I look at it, my eye just doesn't know where to go and it doesn't know where to stop. It just kind of keeps moving around the photo and, uh, it's one that I just I just really love, and it's I don't know if it's the same photo or a different photo that was in the last set of three, but that was done with the neon edges um, was good. But I think this is a little more natural, but it's not quite natural. Um, so it just it's it's always been a favorite of mine. So uh, once again, you can kind of see, like I said, I, I love the the chrysalis rose leaf but the background is kind of plain and you know bare and it doesn't hold a lot of interest the uh, you know the rose leaves and the and the ice and the color you know really do um so that, you know i think that's a really 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 good abstract photo but not the best and um the sunstruck like i said i just find that a little more visually interesting um if you grow the rose or seen the rose, you, you kind of know what it is, but it's a totally different way of seeing it. Um, it just, you know, the voids being darker and kind of the darker edges, it kind of just 
makes the rows seem a lot deeper and just kind of pop a little more. And then for the best, um, I said the rows of Rubifola on my, <laughs> my eyes just don't stop when they look at that. And uh, I picked that one for the best of the three. Great. Bill, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking us through the creative interpretive photos. I'd like to move now to uh, Rich Bear, who will cover macro photography and how to judge some of those uh, macro photos. Uh, Rich Bear also grows only on the West Coast, a thousand and roses as well. Uh, he is very, very active in um, all aspects of exhibiting um, and particularly in photography. He has been, um, he's at the master level as Bill Kay is, but Rich has been at the master level. The master level was created for people like Rich. Uh, he is a, a consulting rosarian and a leader within his organization and gives countless talks on and help uh, to uh, photography, uh, rose photography specifically. Uh, Rich, and I don't know if everyone knows this, he um, took the photo of the peace stamp uh, that was, uh, I don't know, what was that, Rich? Maybe six, in, seven? In uh, 98, eight? 99, no, 2008, oh, wow. 2018. I'm, I'm in the wrong century, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> 2018. Yeah, which was a, a big splash. And he has some beautiful, beautiful photos of peace. Uh, and he takes several thousand photos a year. So he has... Uh, a lot to work from and a lot to share with us today. So, Rich, I turn it over to you. Well, I have to admit, two days ago, it was a major shock to me to have Pam call and say, what I teach judging of macros. Well, I've never judged. Locally, I've, I've done a little judging on our Pacific Northwest. So, um, more I'm going to talk about what I, what I think about how I'd like to have them looked at, whether there is, there is no rules right now to, to doing this, so it, it's be a little different. I started out with macro about 35 years ago when I started teaching Rose classes. And when I worked for Edmonds Roses, we get calls on the phone all the time. We have these insects in the garden and it looks like an alien. And they wanted to know what it was. At that point, I started taking my my macro was taking insects, and I probably taken ten thousand insect pictures. And one of them you'll see in here today. The the problem is that they uh, they aren't too exciting, um, and due to the looking at things very tiny in the garden, looking at the insects, I started taking pictures of other parts of the garden, and that got me into the the macro photography, which I really enjoy today um, but there's a big difference about judging macro photography as opposed to all the other classes and Bill just went, went through very much of the same things that, that I could say and that is th there aren't any uh, there's nothing to compare it to you there's no guidelines there's no point scoring system it's pretty much in the mind of the the uh, the judge as to what he'd like to see and and what will be awarded. Um, so it's it's I think it's it's a difficult class to judge because it is just the interpretation of the of the person doing it, and uh, you, you have no nothing to compare it to. I believe that every time I take a picture and I. I think most photographers are probably this way. They would like it to be something that is beautiful in itself. Um, Bill said the same thing. So I always like to think I would like to see this picture on my office wall. Um, I judged a national photo contest down in San Diego a few years ago. 
And I left a lot of people feeling very unhappy because that is the way I judged it. And they wanted to judge by uh, numbers on classes and all that sort of stuff. And when I got through, um, it, it wasn't the, the the most, the greatest rose ever taking pictures of, but the picture was the most beautiful one I thought in what I wanted to see. Um, a few little notes here. Um, a good macro should portray things that you will not see with the naked eye or cannot appreciate. I mean, that's the idea of the, the macro class was to get very high resolution of, of small things that you can see in the, in the pictures. Um, every macro photo that is probably subjected to judging will be unique. So you have nothing and you just saw Bill's collection and everyone is totally different in deciding which one is the best. Probably if, if eight of us all looked at them, we'd all have eight different ideas. And I would even differ with Bill's idea because I, I didn't think the one that he's really in love with, I wasn't. But it's that's, that first look at it, sometimes it's, it's what it does to you. Um, it's it, in taking a picture of a bloom, you know, we, we, we know what, as an arrangement or as a horticulture judge, you know what excellent blooms look like. But when you're doing these other two classes, there's no rules as to, as to what you should be photographing. Sometimes the macros, to to uh, to be successful, um, most of my insect pictures I think are too simple, and I have the one picture there. I, I thought they're all great macro pictures, but are they satisfying to other people? That they're good for education, because uh, none of my insects look like aliens. They look like the insects they are, and when I do a class, I said I hope I'm showing people what things they really look like. And I said, usually after I give one, I get feedback through the rest of the year because people start looking small in their garden. And a lot of times they never see the things that I show them until I sh show them that these things are there up close and look in a garden. And they, they start seeing them then because they start looking at their garden differently. Um, so what I thought, uh, mostly there's there's picture of a serifid fly larva doing what they do best and that is eat, eat aphids and uh, would that make a good macro to me it's a beautiful macro picture but the judges this there's the wow factor is a, a, a lot short there um, it, it shows what I wanted it to but as a, a beautiful macro picture that's probably not one that would ever wind up in my wall so when I I look at things in the garden, and I, every time I'm in the garden, I'm always looking looking small because I'm looking for things that I think are beautiful and I can I can use and um, and take pictures of because I, I like to have stuff that's pretty. This is the stipules of a keepsake row showing a little bit of fility and the green parts. But overall, the, the beauty of all the little parts in there, I think, make that uh, a good macro photo of what I am. You can, you can see this stuff in the garden, but you probably never looked at it up this close. And it gives you an opportunity to see things that you are, are around you in the garden all the time that you never really look at. And uh, that's the idea is to show you the beauty in, in a lot of the things that you can't see or don't don't see. And after you've picked uh, a number of roses or pictures that have this wow factor that I, that I think is a wow factor, then you can go into picking the best ones by going through the photographic excellence. And that includes focus and the lighting and the distractions and all that sort of material. As I said, I go through, I said I do several thousand photos every year. And one thing I tell all my new photographers, I said, if you want to be known as a good photographer, anything that's not excellent, throw it away and never show it to anybody. Only share the very best things you have and people think you're great. 
Uh, <laughs> I have pictures. I started this, we used film, it was a strange thing. And I would often uh, have large piles of stuff on my desk that were going in the wastebasket. And I take pictures of it. I said, these are all the rejects because if they're less than perfect, I don't want to see them in my collection. Um, because the world is, is beautiful. Here's another one, just the stamens of Monty. Um, you can get the uh, He's not going to tell me what 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 which one it was. So what but anyhow, the... say it again, said Pam. Say, say it again, Rich. Um, Hannah, Hannah Gordon. It's been one of my favorites over yeah. the years because it, it does have such beautiful reproductive parts. I said most people don't look at them that close. But to me, that is a, a photo with, with a great wow factor in, in the beauty of the stigmas and the styles and the and the, the pollen as well. So that's one that would, of the six I, I gave you, I, that is one that I would wind up in, in the final class. Um, but that's, that would not be the final three. There's, there's a few more that I would, that I just flip one of the other ones up there if you would, Pam. Yeah. Okay, in macro, one of the important things I think is showing uh, things that you don't wouldn't normally see because you're blowing it up in, in in a class. And this is every rose leaf in your garden has a stipule on it, and you've probably never looked at one up close and personal. I spent three weeks trying to get this picture last year, um, trying to find the right stipule in the garden, and then also trying to find a way to light it so that I could get the what I wanted to see. And as Bill said, a lot of times you see things in your head and then trying to get them onto a piece of film is can often be very, very difficult. And uh, trying to get the lighting right so that these things showed up. Um, like I said, these you, you'll see them in the garden every day, but you will never see, you'll never see this kind of an, object in the garden because they're way too small to see and i think that is the really the base of all macro photography is showing things that are routine around around you that you've never seen because they're too small to see and just by the the value of macro photography means we're blowing it up so that you can see it and there's a couple more there that i think um that's just another um pigment and style um, with the fillity, which is the people call vegetative centers or stuff like that, but it's a particular situation botanically, uh, the, the green thing throwing out of the middle of the uh, style, I found to be very nice. But on the other hand, the distraction in this one is around the edge. There's a lot of um, parts of this photograph that are brown and not very attractive so it uh, it was included but it was the other one that is similar to it is a much better photograph as far as judging it for me as i'm concerned and then there were other things that you probably won't see and I, I, again i'm always looking for little things i was pruning stormy weather and i noticed that the uh, the, the new growth this is what the new prickles look like on stormy weather. And I thought that looked like something that I'd like to try to get a picture of because I doubt you've ever noticed this, but that's the, the tiny little um, prickles as they're beginning, beginning to grow on stormy weather. And a lot of uh, roses and things have very attractive little stem things that you can take of uh, in the macro section. And they turn out to be very, uh, photogenic. I don't have any special equipment. I just have a uh, 100 millimeter lens that I that I shoot through. Years ago, I got lot, lots of equipment and uh, too cumbersome for me now. I don't mess around much with 
with all the stuff that I used to. Then there was one other one in there too, Pam. And this is another one. This is a, just a peduncle of the Rose Fortune, which is only exists in my garden because it's a sport of another rose. But again, I was pruning it one day and I, you can sort of see things um, when you're working in a garden, but you don't know what they're gonna look like when you blow them up um, to see them uh, 10 times life size. And I tell people, what well, if you're doing macros, always be alert to anything that you see that looks like it might be photogenic. And then you can try to take pictures of it, see if you can get a picture of it that's photogenic. And a lot of times going from seeing it and to, to getting it into a class is very difficult. But when you get to the end, it is, I was supposed to be talking about judging and I uh, find it very difficult to judge because I don't like to be judgmental of other people's work because they have worked very hard at it. Uh, they're usually proud of their work and I'm gonna tell them, no, we don't like it. And that's just something I don't like to do because I think we all do good work in a garden. And if I had to pick one of them, and which which is one of the things that I said Billy Bill did, I would pick the stip the the, the stip hill in the center for the main reason that it allows me to see things and show you things that you have probably never seen. And I think that is the really basis of what we're doing with macro photography. Just taking a picture of uh, petals or something like that up close. We're, we see those all the time, but these three of these four things you have probably never seen in your garden, and that's because they're there. It's just the fact that they're too small for you to see. So the macro photography allows me to share lots of things in, in my garden uh, through 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 that means, and I'm always trying to find some new areas. And uh, I started doing stipules because I was talking to Bob Martin one time and he was talking about polyantha roses and he said they've all got big stipules, which I had never noticed before until I, after talking to Bob. And I spent the rest of the summer shooting stipules on <laughs> roses all over. And this just, just happened to be what I considered of all the pictures I took, which I probably took three, 400 of them, uh, to be the best single picture showing off what a the beauty of a one stipule could look like. So as far as judging is concerned, it, it comes down to what you, what appeals to you more than anything else. And then that, that gets you down to the final few and then you can start applying um, all the rules of photography, which are, you know, focus. Um, I violate, violate a lot of rules and some of which have been written by Bill and Tom. Um, I use way too small of a aperture. They always tell me uh, if you go below 13 or 15, you're going to run into interference. And I'm someday I'm going to call one of these two guys. And say, would they please show me a, send me a picture showing interference? Because in the thousands of pictures that I have taken, and a lot of them I shoot at 29 and 32, I have never seen interference um, degrade any of my pictures. Um, so I don't know what to say about this. I, I wish uh, I had more interesting things to say about judging, but it becomes so personal about looking at things because they're all different. You can't judge a stem against a, a stipule by rules. It, it just doesn't work. And you just have to look at it and say, I think that's a more beautiful picture than this one. And, um, if you've got a team of judges, you're going to wind up with three or four different ones at the top, and then you're going to have to decide some way. And I said, that can be through photography. I said, most of mine have been pretty well selected. If there's nothing in there that's out of focus or backgrounds are distracting or things like that. Um, so it shouldn't be too many things you could be critical of these particular pictures. But then you're looking at a, at a group of different photographers and you'll find lots of different uh, different things that you can look at and be critical of. Great. Rich, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Next time, more than 24 hour notice. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, let's talk about judging garden photos. And garden photos uh, are about composition, blooms, movement, uh, and the journey that that particular photo may take you on. So let's look at a couple of garden photos. I love this photo. I like the, uh, this, it's definitely got roses in it. It's a great photo. If we were advertising hand carts. <laughs> okay. Or, or beautiful wands. Uh, because both dominate uh, the photo. So when we talk about garden photos, we want to be sure that the garden is our central focus, okay? Uh, this is a, a recent uh, garden peak, and this is uh, Dave Candler's photo. Uh, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful snapshot because it looks like we're peering into a garden. The angle makes this in the framing by natural uh, vegetation, the rickety old wooden fence, and the trees in the background. And of course, the garden is in full bloom. So this, it's like being a voyeur and just he captured and framed this beautifully. So uh, it looks like we're peeking into the garden. So great great angle, uh, very different garden photo, love it. And then if we look at this, we talk about movement in a photo and vertical lift to give it interest. And of course it has to be in full bloom. Now this photo has some great, uh, great composition and this this angle in the cropping is superb. If you look at the hedge, the hedge runs uh, throughout. It looks like quadrants in, in the garden, and the um, the hedge anchors the bottom, serves as an anchor the bottom of the of the photo, and you really work your way down the path and through that fountain in the background. So it does take you on a journey, and it's a sweeping view. Uh, and this is not easy to do, and to have the clarity and the uh, the lighting is is great. So it this is all about the composition and the uh, the cropping and the thought that went into how to best display this. Uh, and this is one of uh, Rich's photos. So if I'm putting those three photos together and I have to judge which is the best of those three, um, it would go to this uh, Portland Garden. Okay, so that's, that's all the photos that we'll review today. Uh, we, we haven't uh, covered arrangements and that's uh, with a purpose. Typically arrangements at the local shows is not a class. It's typically more of a, uh, um, a competition class in the district and certainly in the national contest. Uh, the key is having uh, an arrangement judge judge those photos. So you're judging it both from an arrangement standpoint, as well as from a, a photographic standpoint. The one key thing with the arrangement photos is to keep it at eye level. And if there's, or if there's papers or tags or comments, things, you want to remove that because that could add to a distraction. But because we typically don't do that at the local level, We'll, uh, we can address uh, arrangements at another time. Okay, uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time to 
talk about a process to engage and encourage others. Um, because we are the driving force uh, behind exhibiting. You know, you are a judge because uh, we've all mastered horticultural exhibiting. Uh, and we should be front and center and actively encouraging exhibiting, including photography. We, uh, we want to invite rose friends and grandkids over to shoot your garden or meet at a public garden or even at a rose show where everything is groomed uh, so we can enjoy and benefit from something that's already groomed and let people capture those great shots. Uh, if you haven't taken the plunge into photography, we want you want to take hundreds of photos and experiment. Uh, and pretty soon, those hundreds of photos, believe me, will become thousands of photos. And after a rose show, when all the exhibitors uh, come, be there. Make a point to give beneficial advice to those who would like to receive it. Uh, I've done this at uh, many local, district, and national shows where someone has asked, you know, could you give me feedback? Here are this, my seven photos. Uh, I didn't do so well. Could you give me some pointers? And we talked about, you know, the we, we went through the horticultural aspects and the photographic aspects of each of the photos. Very beneficial. And when people overheard that being done, others chimed in to say, oh, you know, could you walk, could you walk me through mine? And it's very beneficial. People come, you know, when the, when the doors open. And if you're there, you want to be the one, if you've judged it, you want to be the one giving the advice. Uh, be sure if you're, even if you're not judging the uh, photography section. You want to congratulate and recognize those participants and to, to encourage this upward progression that I talk about. If it's a local show, encourage them to show in the district. If it's a district show, encourage them to show in national. And if you have solid rose photography skills, you want to tuck others. Uh, you want to have mentees. You want to tuck them under your wing. I know uh, uh, both Rich Bear and uh, Bill Kay, I mean, they have so many people you know, tucked under their wings uh, by doing photo shoots, reviewing their photos, talking to them after shows. Uh, and, you know, I look to, uh, to Curtis was my mentor uh, and uh, Rich and Bill certainly served as my mentor. And I also follow, uh, you know, Tom Mayhew. So, uh, it really helps if you have, you know, a mentor and if you're in the position where you can serve as a mentor to someone, you, you certainly want to do it. Um, and if you desire to develop your photography skills, because this is new information to you, you know, seek out a, a good mentor uh, because that's the way to um, turbocharge your uh, success in photography. So uh, we had talked about uh, you know, three credits for, uh, for this, and one was by reading and rereading the uh, judging manual, and one was attending and asking questions at this seminar. And the last credit is uh, what I'd like for you to do is from your existing photo portfolio, uh, select five photos in different specific classes and then do a cr critique them in photo and horticultural terms okay. and send those photos and critique to American Rose Photo at yahoo.com and that will help you uh, practice what you've learned or heard today use the Manual is your reference tool. Okay, use what you've learned today as your reference tool. Because in this manner, we can engage, build confidence um, in our judging, and we can strive for judging consistency. And for that, there'll be another credit. So I appreciate everyone's uh, 
listening ears. And if, uh, if you have questions, uh, Kim, maybe you can help with that. And uh, myself or Bill or uh, uh, Rich will give it a go. Okay, so uh, thank you, Pam. If you You're have welcome. a question for Pam, Rich or Bill, um, you can post it in the chat pod. I'll read it to them and they'll answer it for you. All right, so we do have one from Colette Morton. She says, if a rose has been staged with a black background, no foliage, creating a floating bloom, how many points would suggest deducting? Would you deduct enough points that it would not qualify for a first? Um, uh, that's a great question, Colette. Um, it's always relative to the competition, and it doesn't necessarily mean it wouldn't qualify for a first. Uh, if there are other contenders, and we use this term, all things being equal, and let's just say there's a photo exactly like it, nestled in shiny green leaves, uh, that may t that would tip the scales. But uh, a, people use a back, black background for a lot of reasons, and it's fine. It's just that these, the floating rose is, uh, it would be a, a point deduction, but it may not take it out of contention. If you go back and you look at, and I encourage you to do so, the um, 2022 digital uh, photo contest, there are some uh, floaters that uh, uh, place very, very high. So it's certainly relative to the competition. Okay, perfect. So Judy Frederick says, without a 400 millimeter lens, is there a way to take a macro photo with an iPhone or skip this class? Rich. Uh, since I take no pictures with an iPhone, I really don't know. You don't need a 400 millimeter lens. I, I used to do mine with a 50. Um, and right now I'm using 100, but uh, a man has to understand his limitations. Your camera can't do what you want it to do. You just won't be able to do it. And if you really are insistent upon wanting to do something particular, you will have to get the equipment to do it. I mean, I, I don't think any iPhones are set up to take pictures of things uh, an inch in front of their cameras. But I don't know that because I don't use one, although I did go out this morning and take pictures of our snow with my iPhone. But uh, if I were thinking about competition, uh, the iPhone would not be in my hand. So I, I don't know how else to answer that because I, I really don't know. Maybe people with more experience with iPhones would know. Thank you, yeah. Bill. <laughs> yeah, I've got an I've got an iPhone 7, so mine's an older one, so I don't know how how good the new ones are. Um, can't really help you with that, but all I can say is give it a shot. Um, try to get it as close as you can, and then you can you know if you can zoom and crop, and you don't get a lot of distortion, um, depending how small what you're shooting, um, you're not going to be able to get some of the stuff Rich does with his with his camera, but um, you know, maybe sections of leaves, sec you know, stamens, uh, sections of thorn, whatever you want to do, give it a shot, try it, um, see how it looks. Okay, and then also James Beardsley commented that you can purchase macro lenses from smart for smartphones. So that's oh. a suggestion for chat. Okay, yeah. thank you. That's okay. new. <laughs> All right, Rebecca Shaw says, will the judging rose photography ever be included within Hort? Say it again. She says, will the judging rose photography ever be included with Hort? Well, um, 
maybe I'm not understanding the question, but um, rose photography judging does fall under horticulture. You need to be a horticulture judge to judge photography. Maybe I'm not answering the question or I don't understand it, but it is, it is I mean, it's, the, the basis is for Okay. All right, and then the next question will be, wait just a second. This is for Pam. What are your thoughts about regional differences in color in a bloom? Example, the two Hannah Gordons. <laughs> yeah. And Jackie uh, Knight. Yeah. So in, in the rules and guidelines, um, we actually have an alert that things grow, uh, roses grow differently under different environments. We want the rose to be, you know, representative of a variety. Um, I know this past year we had some questions about, you know, sun glow, and rightfully so. It was a sun glow grow, uh, sun glow that was atypical looking. It was, it was a blue, but um, uh, it was grown in the shade. Um, and and looked like it was you know grown in the shade. It was a different coloration. It didn't preclude uh, you know advancing. It was a blue and considered with with other blues. So we do take that uh, into account. Uh, and if judges have questions, uh, we we call around and uh, to the hybridizer or to that region. Uh, to one verify, yes, it is that that rose, or to the exhibitor to verify it is that rose. So we take that into account. It should be representative of that particular variety, wherever it's grown. Okay. Let me find another question here. I generally judge Hort at the San Diego Rose Society Spring Show. Would it be appropriate to ask the chair of judges to allow me to be an apprentice photography judge? And that's from Dwayne Robbie. Oh, yeah, it, it, it is always good to study and watch uh, from those who have uh, successfully done it before, uh, you know, to follow along and to learn and listen, you know, even having you know the aides listen to the judges' comments is is very beneficial because uh, it may inspire them you know to be a judge one day. So uh, absolutely, you know, by all means, go for it. the The key, and I hope it's not uh, missed by anybody, is you know this whole uh, judging is about engagement. This engagement of you know putting your photos out there or putting your hoard exhibits out there. Uh, if, if you're judging, don't turn your back on exhibiting. You know, there are always judges categories. And so, or, or you wanna be sure there are in your uh, schedule and particularly in photography, th uh, throw your uh, uh, photos in that class and, and have them judged and you, you learn by doing and by getting the appropriate feedback. So uh, yeah, that's that would be well supported. Okay, Patsy Cunningham says, Rich, did you say you use a regular 100 millimeter lens for your extreme macros? Currently, it's the only lens I own that fits my Canon F5. So the answer is yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Rose Gilardi says, do we still deduct for touching the frame? <laughs> uh, yes, I think some, uh, the answer is yes, but I think some people may carry that to the extreme. If a, if the rose is, if the 
the bloom is truncated. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to judge, and if it's missing, uh, let's say a, a fifth of, of the bloom. If if you have oh a beautiful spray or and you're missing one one thousandth of a leaf, um, you can't. <laughs> say that that's the same deduction if you're missing a quarter of a bloom. So, uh, you, you know, this gets at, at judging and applying, you know, some uh, common sense. You, you don't want to truncate the, your subject, but sometimes, you know, if you shave a hair off, that's much different. Okay. Greg Madsen has three separate questions. I'll start with the first one. Hi, Greg. <laughs> uh, why do they not have a single class to enter for those who use a black background for entry? So that's his first question. Not, not have a single class for black backgrounds. Yeah, uh, because the classes are ARS classes focused on roses, not classes focused on background. That's my simplest, simplest answer. Okay. Okay. All right. The second question is, where do you find the manual that you spoke of to print out for the members who are interested in entering? Oh, okay. It's at rose.org backslash photography, rose.org backslash photography. Okay, last one. Is there it's anything called, just, just, it's called guidelines and rules for judging rose photography. It's 51 pages and that's, it's, it's a large manual because it's quite detailed, covers a lot of ground, uh, and also, you know, it pulls in both the hort aspect and the photography aspect. Okay. All right. So last question from Greg is, is there any software that can be recommended for doing effects on photos? Bill, Rich, what are your recommendations? You know, I'm still using Photoshop too. I'll bet you Bill's got a little bit more advanced. I think the current one is Photoshop 20. Uh, I'm gonna surprise you, Rich. I use Photoshop Elements. <laughs> I see. I don't even know what that is, Bill. That's the uh, that's the cheapest version of Photoshop. It's not a <laughs> it's not even a full Photoshop. And uh, another secret, don't tell anybody. I usually shoot most of my photos on my Nikon on automatic or close-up version. So the things you were talking about before, you you got to talk to Tom about because I, okay. I haven't gotten that deep into it yet. I just read your I just read the articles on photography. I read everything yeah. I can. I always say if you want to learn something, listen to people that know more than you do. Absolutely. Well, that's that's Tom. He knows more than me. Okay. But, Two recommendations there. Okay, perfect. All right, a question from Hilda, Hilda Stanger. Uh, when you crop your photo, does the distort, does this distort the rest of the photo? No, it it, it shouldn't at all. Um, and the one, the wonderful thing about digital photography. The, you know there there is no set aspect ratio and by that i mean you know five by seven eight by ten four by six whatever uh you know you you crop it to achieve a certain effect and and that can be any size where in print contests and there's no distortion there's just cropping and you can crop on your smartphone or you uh I, I like to 
crop on a big screen. I like to crop on my computer. Um, but there shouldn't be any any distortion. It's good to, um, you know, take different angles and different uh, step backs, if you will, you know, from a from your subject. So uh, you can see which is going to be best for cropping. Uh, not, I, I would say people who compete in rose photography, they don't just just snap a single um, photo uh, of a subject. Uh, they may take uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 photos of the same subject so they know when they get back and do the post-processing, they have something to work with. Pam, I think uh, maybe what she's talking about is um, we we had a, a newsletter editor um, that used to try to make photos fit a certain size, and they would drag the corners on the computer to make the photo fit. And when you do that, you lose your aspect ratio. So that could possibly be what she's talking about. Um, uh, okay. Because it'll stretch the width or the height if you're trying to, you know, Put a four by six photo into a five by seven block. Um, oh, okay. So uh, that so that possibly might be what she's talking about. It. Yeah, yeah, to force it to another aspect oh. ratio. Um, not actually I cropping see. it, but trying to stretch the photo to fit, which will oh. distort the aspect ratio. Yeah, which if you're taking up a person, it may make that person thinner or fatter. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> same with the rotor okay. sensor. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, uh, next question is from Colette Morton. She says, how do we get credit for reading the manual? Well, uh, I'm going to, I will send out through Kim uh, and headquarters uh, details for uh, reading the manual, attending the session, and then for the third credit submitting your portfolio of, of uh, specific classes and doing your own critique from a Hort perspective and from a photo perspective. So for all the attendees on this call, look for um, a follow-up message. Okay. All right. Um, there's no more questions that I can see. There are some comments. Uh, we have a few more minutes if you'd like to hear some of the comments that are that were sure. shared. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, just a second. Denise says there is an app for iPhone that creates photos similar to a macro lens. Uh, don't know how good it is though. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thanks. Um, Paul Colombo coming uh, about the Hannah Gordon, uh, Tabrice and Nicole, or Nicole. Yes, some roses look a little different depending on where and how they are grown. Yep. Okay. All right. And let's see here. Uh, Denise also recommended going to your app store to search for those apps that'll help you get those macro lenses. She said, just type in macro lenses and that should help you. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Jackie and I actually did have another question. She said, if you are a horticulture judge, are there other steps to be a rose photography judge? Uh, yes, engagement. Uh, engagement in uh, in competitions because that's when you truly learn how to be a judge. And if you think about the Hort path that people are on, you uh, you don't just decide one day to become a, a Hort judge. You know, there's there's a process. Well, this is a, a similar process of engagement, so you can hone your skills and and be that um, better photography judge. And uh, so engagement is key. Okay, 
Uh, Jim and Ann Herring wants to know, will this program be on the ARS website? I hope so. You can help me with that, can't you, Kim? I will. <laughs> right. Yes, Jim <laughs> and Ann. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, um, Tom Mayhew says that Nikon makes a 105 millimeter macro lens for Nikon cameras, and he uses the one for mac macro photos, uses that one for macro photos. So okay. a lot of about those macro lenses here. Thank you. Um, um, give me just another second. Excellent seminar from Colette Martin. All the examples and explanations really help to understand the guidelines. Oh, good. That I'd love to hear that music to my ears. You know, and the whole intent of this is to build confidence and consistency. So thank you, Colette. Okay. And then Margaret Barr has a question. I asked correct that these credits, oh, she says, is it correct that these credits go toward our court judging? Yes. All right. So it looks like we're almost to the top of the hour, Pam. Did you want to make any closing re remarks? No, well, I'd like to thank uh, Bill Kay and Rich Fair for their uh, great support. And and all those master photographers, uh, uh, Tom Mayhew, John Mattia, uh, that and others who have shaped, you know, this this whole program. Uh, gratefully uh, appreciated um, and can't thank you enough. If you look at the the master photos, uh, it's a small group. It's uh, probably about 12 uh, photographers uh, on East and West Coast. Lou Evans is part of that as well um, and, and several others, but um, truly uh, many, many thanks to them. Appreciate you on the call, Tom. All right, and thank you, Pam. Thank you, Rich, and thank you, Bill, for such a great presentation. I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar. Um, please check your emails and our uh, Facebook page, uh, website, YouTube channel for videos and upcoming webinars. And thank you all for attending. Have a great day. Thank you very much.